You know, I, doing the research on this last night uh, really shocked me as I was writing this piece. Uh, first of all, the question, and, and, you know, and I laid out this question for you, are the Democrats going to get a handle on, on crime or, or the perception of crime? And, and these are not two disconnected problems, but they are kind of in separate buckets. Uh, homicides are up dramatically. Right. Uh, according to the National Public Radio, according to NPR, they're up f five times, 500 percent here in Portland. They're they're double, uh, the, you know, uh, the previous year in many other cities. Now, obviously, you compare 2021 to 2020 and you're going to get very skewed statistics because during 2020, so many people were locked down that an awful lot of crime went down. So when it goes back up now, is it going back up to normal? No, it turns out it's going up back up to way above normal. So how much damage will this do to the Democratic Party, particularly given that most big city mayors are Democrats? And are the Republicans licking their chops on this? You betcha. They are already highlighting rising crime rates around the country. And, and frankly, I think if the Democrats in general and Joe Biden, President Biden in particular, don't take this opportunity to show real leadership on what is actually a real problem, they're gonna, they're gonna get hurt badly in 2022 and 2024. You know, I, I've told the story here on this program about how a burglar tried to break into our house, uh, the doors were all locked, couldn't get in, so went two houses down and broke into a person's house, uh, catching, catching uh, the, the, uh, the, the woman of the home in the shower. I mean, you know, after, after they'd looted the house. And it's uh, and then, you know, Louise and I had a uh, offered a file, you know, file a police report. We had video of her, and uh, you know, of the burglar, and and uh, it never got acted on. But this isn't unique to Portland. This is happening all over the place. And I point out, Nextdoor.com has become kind of ubiquitous in America. It's like a a local version of Facebook. It's where you get together and talk with your neighbors about what's going on, and. I've been, you know, on face on nextdoor.com for a couple of years now, and probably four years. And you know, two years ago, a year ago, uh, most of the postings, well, before COVID anyway, most of the postings on nextdoor.com were, "Hey, I, I lost my cat," or I, "I just found a dog," or you know, "Whose is it?" or uh, "Who wants some extra zucchini? My garden has uh, overflowed." Now. And again, I, I know this isn't just Portland. You know, I mean, you can just you know plug open nextdoor.com and just look at any community in America. Now, we've got here in Portland, people are crowdsourcing finding stolen vehicles. I mean, just in the part of Portland where I live, in the last three days, people have gotten together and found a stolen bicycle and found a stolen van both of which somehow ended up over at one of the local homeless encampments. People are posting pictures of burglars, of snatch and grab thieves, people who've committed assaults. Neighborhood watch committees are being formed by communities all over, all over Portland, but literally all over the United States. And it even goes beyond that. You've got uh, right now Seattle, Milwaukee, Chicago, Dallas, and this is just the tip of the iceberg. These are the ones that I, I was e easily able to find with just a quick Google search. Neighborhoods in these cities are hiring private security, in many cases armed private security, to patrol their neighborhoods because they don't feel that the police are doing their jobs. And truth be told, police numbers are down. Here in, here in Portland, it's gone from, uh, I think it was 615 police officers in 2020 to 536, if I'm remembering my numbers correctly, this year. Now, and this is happening around the country, but, you know, police force numbers are down, you know, a, a little bit. It's actually nas nationwide, it's only about a 1% drop. 6% of all jobs have vanished, but only about 1% of police jobs have vanished. And there's a reason for that. 
Cops are very well paid. They have a union. They have, you know, it's a good union job with good job security and typically a good pension. And who wants to blow that away? But on the other hand, last year in 2020, what you had was an awful lot of cops who were older, cops in their 50s and early 60s, who were who had put in their 20 years. They were eligible, or whatever the local cop provided for. They were eligible for early, for early retirement and a pension. They were staying on the job because the pay is good, and the longer you stay, the more your pension grows. But they just, I mean, this was before the vaccines. They just didn't want to get out there in public and expose themselves to a deadly disease being in their 50s and 60s, and so they took early retirement. And you've got a lot of police officers who did that all across the country. And it has, you know, it has cut into, into policing. But the, it, it, you know, but the Republicans are running around going, oh, you know, the Democrats are defunding the police. No, not so much. Yeah, there are some cities that have reallocated some of their police budgets to nonviolent community intervention. And in, in some cases, it seems to be working very well. In other cases, not so good. And this is a conversation we should have. But nobody is, you know, radically cutting back on police with regard to real crime. But what we're seeing now is these individual neighborhoods in cities around America are starting to hire their own guards. I mean, this is I, I, I've worked in the third. I worked in the third world for 20 years doing international relief work. And I, I remember one time in Bogota, Colombia, driving down the freeway, and there was this giant billboard for a new neighborhood that had just been built, and they were selling houses in this new neighborhood. And on this, in this billboard, there's a picture of, the, of these nice little middle-class houses. They look like a house that, you know, in today's America might sell for 100000 150000 little ranch houses. And there were little kids in the yard and stuff in this, picture, in this giant billboard, and then the whole bottom third of the billboard was a uh, chain link fence with razor wire across the top. And standing behind it were two guys with uh, AK-47s, obviously patrolling this neighborhood that they were selling as safe for kids. This was in Bogota, Colombia. I've seen things like that or neighborhoods like that in Jakarta, in Nairobi, in Juba, South Sudan, in Lima, Peru, in Mumbai, India, in Mexico City, in Cairo, Bangkok, Manila, Colombo, Sri Lanka. I've been in all those places and I've seen this in all those places. And these are indications of communities in crisis, of places where the government is not doing its role. And, and I'm telling you, you know, the, uh, America doing this indicates that we have communities in America in crisis. And if there's anything that politicians know how to exploit, it's a crisis. And that's what's going on right now. And you've got, you know, it, it's this, this is going to, it, it, you're not hearing a lot about this in the news right now. Although I'm curious what you're seeing in your town or in your community, or how this is being treated in the press locally where you live. Because I'm telling you, as we get closer to the 2022 election, crime is gonna become a big issue. And Republicans are gonna be blaming this on Democrats. You know, I, I, I told you the story of Louise being chased down the street by a homeless schizophrenic, throwing a water bottle at her and screaming obscenities at her. Um, this, in some ways, goes back to the, to the 1980s. I mean, back in the 1970s, President Jimmy Carter pushed through the Mental Health Systems Act. It expanded federal and state-funded residential treatment facilities for mentally ill people and gave mentally ill people more options like local treatment clinics and the ability to self-administer their medications. When Reagan came into office in 81, one of the first things he did was cancel Carter's program. He repealed it. And he cut federal, and then the next year he cut federal funding for mental illness by 30%. And the result, and as the New York Times pointed out in an editorial in 1981, quote, deinstitutionalization has become a cruel embarrassment, a reform gone terribly wrong, threatening not only the former mental inmates, but also the quality of life for all New Yorkers. Three years later, in, in 1984, they did a follow-up piece. They said, quote, the policy that led to the release of most of the nation's mentally ill patients from the hospital to the community is now widely regarded as a major failure. One third, the best estimate, and you, you can find this easily, easily Google this, one third 
of people who make up the homeless population in most cities in America are mentally ill. And we're not providing services. We're not doing anything about this. If the Biden administration doesn't get ahead of this, the crime problem, the mental illness problem, we're gonna have a real problem in the next election.